Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Can everyone hear us okay? Definitely me with my voice, but uh, if you let us know if uh, it's hard to hear at any other point uh, this evening. And thank you very much for coming out. I'm Damon Connolly. I'm your uh, Marin County Supervisor representing this area for about the past year now. Uh, so I'd like to start by saying thank you for the privilege. Um, and what uh, we're going to do this evening is hear information about the cleanup efforts at Marinwood Plaza, which I know is a, a great concern to the community. Most importantly, though, what we've tried to do is get everyone we need to in the same room. And by that, I mean the Regional Water Quality Control Board. I'll shorten that maybe t this evening to Regional Water Board which is the agency that will ultimately evaluate and approve any cleanup plan for the site. We also have a representative of the owners here. Uh, we uh, will have him available this evening as well. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, myself, and my role basically is I'm your representative. So what I've tried to do throughout the process is convene folks who are involved in this issue and ultimately serve as uh, your representative uh, as we go forward with this. But most importantly, we have you in the room. And by that I mean uh, this whole uh, process to, is to get your concerns, to get your input. Um, by law, the Regional Water Board, as they go forward with these kind of processes, have to take public input. But I want to say, um, and I appreciate it, they made a point, and it doesn't always happen, of actually coming out to us this time. So beyond us sending in written comments, they're here. They're going to offer um, firsthand what the process is going to involve and also take our input uh, uh, virtually near the site here. And finally, we have um, representatives from Geologica, which is actually the engineering firm that has been retained by the owners to come up with the plan. So let me uh, mention a few names. So from the Regional Water Board, we have Diane White, Stephen Hill, Laurent Mellier, and Ralph Lambert. From Geologica, we have Brian Aubrey and Dan Matthews. Uh, welcome. From Marinwood LLC, the Plaza Ownership, we have Tom Fitzsimmons. And again, he's representing the owners, the Hoyts. From Silvera Ranch, uh, which is also very interested in this process and is a valued community member for us here, uh, we have Renee Silvera and her representative, uh, Dave Trotter. Oh, welcome, Lorraine. Thank you. Very nice to see you this evening. Again, I think we have, uh, we have everyone. So it goes without saying we've all been frustrated with how this process has proceeded to date and the length of the process overall. I am pleased that we've gotten to this stage where we're reviewing a plan for final cleanup of the property. And again, I appreciate the Regional Water Board from coming to our neck of the woods to hear firsthand what's on our minds. We're going into the field at this point to gather public comment, and I'll note, if you haven't already, please sign up. And also, uh, we have question cards for your use uh, as well, and, and you can also come up and speak uh, live as well if you'd like. If you would like as well, you can always submit written comments uh, up to uh, the deadline and, and perhaps Ralph of the Regional Water Board can reaffirm what that deadline is and how to get those additional comments if you have them uh, to them. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to the community members who have really taken the lead in keeping this issue front and center in appearing at countless meetings before the Regional Water Board and continuing even to help organize this event. Starting with Bill Mc McNicholas, thank you Bill. Let's give him a round of applause. And his team. 
So I believe I speak for everyone when I say we've really appreciated your work. Again, and I stated it earlier, the Regional Water Board is the governing agency with jurisdiction over this process and over final approval of this plan. And they will be recording and accepting commentary that we receive here tonight. Tonight, I look forward to hearing information on the plan from the engineers, a presentation from to the toxicologist who is present here this evening to give some information on PCE, which is the chemical we're talking about here, and information on the plan review process, including, very importantly, the timeline. And again, just to emphasize though, the main reason we're here is to hear from you. This is all about the public. I too have raised my own issues, concerns, and questions regarding the plan, and I've actually submitted them in writing to the Regional Water Board. But I've also brought a number of copies here tonight, so please help yourselves to uh, my written comments. And to the extent I personally have any further comments or questions based on what we hear tonight, I'll also be sure to take advantage of our opportunity here and raise them. But again, the main thing is we want to hear from you. So we want to make sure that we remain focused on the task at hand here tonight, which is reviewing the proposed cleanup plan Although all of us have an ultimate interest in what happens to that property in terms of future possible development or reuse, that's not what we're focused on here tonight. I think you'll agree with me, the first step in moving forward in any manner is to get the property cleaned up. So that's what we're focused on here. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, get started with our agenda. Bill, who do we have uh, first on tap? Ralph. All right, Ralph. Or Diane. No. Steven? It's July. Okay. Okay. Do we have a printed agenda, by the way? Yeah, yeah, somewhere right here. Yeah. Hopefully, everyone has a copy. Dan, you're up. No. You're up, Dan. Geologica is going to present a summary of December's off-site soil vapor sampling. Welcome, Dan. My name is Dan Matthews. I'm a geologist with Geologica, and I have uh, directed the field work to this site since uh, 2008. And uh, most recent round of work was uh, so they were testing in the Casa Marinewood neighborhood in December of 2015. And I have uh, a brief presentation, if I can find it on the computer. After our jumping around. I get this Sorry for the delay. Casa Marin, the community directly across from the shopping center? Directly to the west, yes. <coughs> oh, so get the map. I'll just make a quick announcement. There's more chairs back here that we can move around, so you're welcome to stand, but it should be more comfortable sitting. Help yourself to some chairs. So, my part of the talk is to discuss the, uh, the December soil vapor, uh, sorry, the December soil vapor testing, and the uh, uh, give you a summary of the remedial action plan. Hold it up closer, Dave. Better? Yeah. Right. Better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of the people in the audience here were in the uh, October, November meeting where we talked about previous soil vapor testing work at the site. Uh, we collected soil vapor samples. These are samples of the uh, vapor in the soil uh, shallow depth uh, below the ground surface, which uh, in most locations would just be something like ambient air. Uh, 
in the vicinity of a dry cleaner, it can become uh, contaminated with the dry cleaning solvent. And we collected samples uh, around the dry cleaner, in front of the dry cleaner, and in successive uh, investigations moved to the west as we followed the uh, sampling results to the well, west side of Marinwood Avenue. So uh, in October, uh, when we last met, we had this information at hand and proposed uh, uh, going out in December and collecting additional soil vapor samples uh, partly to move out into the neighborhood at Casa Marinwood to the west and partly to collect more samples on the property. So uh, the little squares on the map there are the locations we propose to test. Uh, approximately two dozen in the neighborhood, the Casa Marinwood neighborhood west of the site and uh, additional ten on the property. Uh, this is a description of our cell vapor sampling procedure. Uh, this procedure is, is developed basically by the uh, Department of to Toxic Substances Control. It's uh, a, a standard, so we tried to follow the standard for collecting these samples. Uh, we had a mobile laboratory out of the site. It's a, it's a van with uh, laboratory equipment in it, and they tested the samples uh, as we were working so they could give us results in, in within generally 30 minutes. Uh, as you see, in the neighborhood, we did not detect the PCE or other, any other products that are associated with the dry cleaning solvent. Uh, had we detected uh, PCE in the neighborhood, we were prepared to collect additional samples, but that didn't become necessary. Uh, on the property itself, uh, we were investigating uh, the idea that the, uh, the vapor from the dry cleaning solvent might move along utility alignments like sewer pipes, uh, the storm drain, natural gas, and uh, what our testing showed was that that does seem to be the case, that uh, between utility pipes we didn't find the dry cleaning solvent, but particularly along the natural gas pipeline, which uh, is, comes off the corner of the, uh, the liquor store and goes out to the street, we found this uh, solvent was moving along that pipeline. Here, do you need a pointer, Dan? <laughs> yeah, you have a pointer? Yeah. yeah. Just press the little button. Does it work? You got a red light? Damn. <laughs> Another one? <laughs> All right, Major, does that one work? Okay. Okay, we go. So, I'm sorry, here's Brinwood Market, uh, the same more liquor store, and then there's a natural gas pipeline that happens to come off uh, the street and goes into the corner of the building. We found PC along the edge of this uh, uh, natural gas pipeline and also along the storm drain. The detection limit? What is the dry number that we should be looking for? Uh, <clears throat> the detection limit for PCE in these samples was 100 no, micrograms per cubic meter. The action level. The action level? Yeah. The action level. The action level, the residential limit is 210 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, so these values on site, uh, were this to be residential development, those would be high numbers for residential development. And the ND means? Not detected. So the, out in the neighborhood, we did not detect uh, the dry cleaning solvent or related compounds. Yeah. Should I question now or after? You talking question now or not? Uh, I'm okay with questions. You know, we're, we're not staying on formality here, but why don't we, Dan, what's your preference on, do you want to get through your presentation and take some questions? Yeah, but, I mean, it's up to you. Uh, yeah. I. It's a yeah, short presentation, but you want to ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about this slide. Uh, you mentioned that your suspicion 
is that the uh, vapor go through the utility line. And you have, I, I am a Maribu resident, and you have a lot of places that you check, but you didn't check on the utility line. So the 2300 that is very high, that is in the door of Casa Marigold, right. that it was for the utility line, right? And if I didn't did what you mentioned the last time that we need, that it was why it was so high. Right. Because beside it was 310, but that one it was on the utility line. So why when you went to Casa Marigold, you didn't do the same on the utility line? What it, well, that, that, that sample isn't on the utility line, it's in the sidewalk next to, next, next to the natural gas pipeline. Uh, these samples here are next to those utilities. But they are not on. It, no. It, it uh, is next to the yeah. show, like happened on Marigold Avenue. So I, I, don't, I am not too happy with that result because that's an answer. It's on the utility line that follow the yellow line is, is still or not a vapor gun. Well, uh, these samples here are not directly on the utility line, but uh, if there's something migrating along the line, we see it next to the line. Uh, same process, if, if there was PCE coming out here, we'd see it, if it's a if it's moving off of the utility alignment, it's, we see it in the neighborhood. We don't see any uh, gradient that is like disappear. Suddenly we get to Casa Manipur and disappear. Now there is no gradient. It the only, the only uh, driving force for this is concentration gradients. And uh, there is not, there's nothing but that to push it around. So, so I think that we should retest <coughs> all the people to be sure that it's not really there. Uh, you can make that comment. I think you probably tested as close to the utility lines as utilities will let you. Yeah. Right? Um, the, the samples here, uh, I believe this is 109 uh, uh, Grande Paseo and uh, 107. Those were, we had to hand auger because we were so close to the utilities that we couldn't get closer. Uh, that, that's, that's as close as you can get. But, but you have no detection west of the center. That's right. So it's yeah. basically in the center and east of the center. This yeah. can, can I make a suggestion? Clarifying <coughs> questions are going to be great, but if, if, we, if we spend too much time on each point, Dan's not going to get through his talk. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe yeah. just through all of it. quick clarification and then keep going. Can we go? Cool. Go, 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 go. I was wondering if you checked along the, we use recycled water from the water department. Did you check along those lines? The recycled line, there's one coming in this way. Uh -huh. uh, there may be, there, there are two lines here, and uh, we did sample along here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a question? Okay. Are you some of those numbers? I can't read that well. Or zoom in on where their numbers actually have value. Uh, Reading would be easier than zooming in. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that, that map is back here. In fact, yeah. If you want to read yeah. it, it's posted on. No, I was wondering what was the method you used to pick those particular areas? Uh, yeah, and I was going to suggest that too. If you can kind of give the backdrop on on why those areas were picked with, yeah. with the methodology. Well, the way we started actually was uh, just a parcel map. Uh, and frequently when we're doing an aerial survey, we just step out in a grid. But this time, because we had a suspicion that things were moving along the utilities, uh, we spent two days uh, mapping utilities in that neighborhood. And there are, everything is underground in the Casa Marinwood neighborhood. So water, gas, electric, everything is, is, under, is underground. Most of it is under the streets. Uh, there are some laterals, uh, smaller laterals that run off to each house, and there's also a, a sanitary sewer that runs kind of right through the houses here, so we sampled along that. Uh, there's a storm drain that runs right through the houses here that we sampled along, but, but we tried to take the, the, the parcel map, add the utilities to it, which 
took a lot of effort to do, and then sample along those utilities to see where the preferential flow paths are. I'm sure you could have contacted PG&E and it would have helped you get closer to the utility lines. We do that as a matter of course, but... Uh, you didn't think it necessary? I know, we did contact PG&E. They're, they're the good guys. Uh, the, the sanitation and water district, you have to... They, they, it takes a little bit to get cooperation, and, and they, some things just aren't on the maps. Any further questions? Or can I move on? Okay. So, uh, talk a little bit about the remedial action plan. Uh, the plan involves several elements. Uh, looking at those, uh, the, the migration of constituents along the utilities on the property. Uh, one thing we'd like to do is try to cut those pathways in the near term, like sooner rather than later. And that would involve uh, cutting trenches across those uh, utility lines and then uh, replacing the, the sand that they typically put pipes in, uh, replacing it with clay. So we wouldn't dig up the entire line, but we'd cut across the line and then replace the, the sand backfill with clay. Uh, the other uh, work element, which is a, a significant work element, is conducting an additional investigation uh, on the Silvera Ranch property and, and further to the east to delineate the groundwater plume, which I'll show you a map in a minute. Uh, and then uh, taking down the building and then digging up the impacted soil beneath the old dry cleaning machine. So those are the major work elements. Uh, the, after we take out the soil, uh, we'd establish new monitoring wells uh, in the dry cleaner and then at locations uh, downgrading to the site to the east to monitor groundwater quality uh, changes in response to removing the, the soil, which is where most of this uh, remaining uh, dry cleaning solvent is located. It's, it's in the soil. Uh, then uh, after doing the excavation, establishing new wells, we'd monitor the uh, water quality and soil vapor quality and track the progress with that in time to uh, document that, that removing the soil addressed all the issues. And a number of years ago, at the dry cleaners itself, they knocked out a bunch of concrete inside, and they spent weeks there uh, pouring liquids or something, or cements or something down below, and didn't know what it was. They didn't know when to go in there. Was that just a masking uh, event, or was there actually something being done? You're saying you have to go under the actual store. Well, the, we did that work, and uh, we went into two rounds of treatment. It was about 15 years ago. No, it was uh, 2011. No, this was a long time before that. I'm not. A, I've only been on for eight years, so it was exactly. before that. That's why I but uh, mm, that I know nothing about. Um, if you want to put that into a comment, really yeah. Um, anything else? But Dan, maybe you could explain the injection work that you did do a number of years ago. Do you want to just hit on that? Yeah. Because that, I think, is informative. Yeah. Now, what we did do in, in 2011, we had two rounds of treatment inside the dry cleaner where we were trying to in inject a, a liquid treatment product, an oxidizer, just kind of like uh, bleach. I remember that, too. Okay. We, we, cut out, we first tried just drilling holes through the floor and injecting product. Uh, the problem with that was that uh, the liquor store is still occupied and that is very clay soil. When we injected this product under pressure, it, instead of going in to treat the soil, it ran sideways and popped up in the liquor store. So, uh, there, there are more cooperative sites out there. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't aware that, that someone had done work in, uh, 15 years ago. I have never heard about that. Dan also was successful in the other portion of the property. Yeah. Now, in the liquor store, we had problems with things popping up, uh, which made it, and because we had a tenant there, it made it difficult to get back in to do anything. Uh, outside the liquor store, in a place we call the Eastern Hotspot, which is out by the fence, uh, we did the oxidizer injection. Uh, and then collected soil samples and documented a decrease in the concentrations of dry cleaning solvent. There we were able to, to burn the area and force the liquid to go back into the ground. And then 
after uh, waiting a, a spell to let the oxidizer exhaust itself, we injected a, a bio, biological treatment product into the ground in that eastern hotspot area. And that treatment has reduced the concentrations of dry cleaning solvent in that area. Uh, so outside the dry cleaner, uh, we clean up the soil. We, uh, I have a chart in the back there that shows how the concentrations in soil vapor and ground were dropped off after the treatment. Inside, we had trouble uh, injecting product because it was coming back up. Uh, other well, long story short, did the dry cleaner get rid of their solvents in an illegal manner, or are they, we have lots of dry cleaners in RIN, do they all follow the same process, dump them in the ground? Well, uh, I mean, just a short story. Yeah. Please. Well, we've looked at the historical practices at dry cleaners, because at the regional water board, we are overseeing the cleanup of, of many of them, and we are starting to see a trend towards what was common industry practice, and, and often that did include dumping of material into nearby areas, parking lots and stuff. There was also a lot of spillage that took place with filling of the solvents you know, in and out of trucks. And then some of the machines were actually designed where the material had to be basically transported, and there was a lot of excess dripping that took place. So um, the industry practices in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s were not particularly good. It was really in the 70s where the fire departments became involved more with doing a lot of inspections, looking for hazardous waste and materials as we then moved into the 80s. And to where we are now, we've seen you know, more and more regulations and awareness come into play. So the situation at Marinwood is not per se unusual. This is where a lot of growing awareness of how significant this problem is statewide and nationwide. So it's happened elsewhere in Marin and it's been cleaned up in a timely manner? Well, some places really there was less spillage. There was no indoor spillage. There was more material that made it into the sewage treatment plant as opposed to the groundwater. And then the groundwater conditions themselves, if the soil is sandy versus clayey. So it's, um, we've, we've seen a spectrum all over. Were the Armstrong Garden Center up in Nevada, was a contaminated dry cleaning site that was, and cleaned, up, that was cleaned up quickly because of the desire of the chemical to come in? There's lots that aren't cleaned up in a lot of cases. If it's only the dry cleaner, they have uh, no money basically, and so there's lots of dry cleaning sites that have not been cleaned up or that haven't even been investigated very well. Thank you. I also noticed in talking with some of the audience beforehand that some of you are, are new to this process, and I apologize, we kind of jumped into this very technical, isolated aspect of this cleanup. So I did want to point out that there is a fact sheet here, which you know, gives you some more history and an overview, and we'll be happy to talk to you more about that. But seeing the audience now, perhaps <coughs> I'm thinking we should have started with a bigger picture here of the history and then moved into this. So apologize about that. I'm happy to pass one of these to you now. They're on the table. <coughs> you can also get you on a mailing list if you're not on, so that you can be mailed this kind of material as well. So this is like a quick overview of the, the site and the history. And I think it's also important to note that the owner is always responsible. So legally, even if it chain of custody, the property ultimately is purchased by someone else, that original owner remains responsible. They can work out an arrangement amongst themselves, but it be you and me, that original party is always responsible. And who is taking the documentation from one owner to the next owner to the next? So apparently 15 years ago something was done, but it wasn't documented because they do it now again. there. Well, first of all, it's, a, it's always been the same owner throughout the road, and actually even far longer. Second of all, this has been involved in a process for years and years, mm -hmm. frankly, it's coming more to your head now. Um, that's what we need to keep pushing. But there's a history there, as, as I think a lot of long-term residents know. So, um, okay, so Dan. All right, uh, let me continue. Uh, I would note that the 
cleanup is the cleanup is expensive, and in most cases, the cleanup costs are borne by the property owner, not the dry cleaner. And uh, the the cost has, in most cases, comes from redevelopment, you know, the sale of the property. Uh, so uh, this property. Why is that? Is the responsibility of the owner to clean up? Why is it way to be sold and developed to make somebody do something? Cash, money, to do the work. That's, that's, that's what drives the cleanup process in a lot of cases. So the Hoyt family is uh, claiming poverty? They can't pay for it? <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Let's not jump to the end yeah. of the story. Yeah. <laughs> I, like I said, no one's getting out of responsibility, right? Yeah, but they formed a separate so, LLC. Does that get them off the hook? So let's the continue family? with what needs to be done and then reemphasize, as we hear from our regulators, What's going to happen to ensure that? Well, isn't part of it to keep people from being harmed from this and not save money? I mean, for real. Yeah. I mean, is there any and, and what you've told us now, you have a chemical problem. You have new data where this is spreading. Right? I mean, that's a, that's a sense of urgency right there in any matter. I think the company is playing why we are here. Is it proposal that it was. The owner was asking to write a proposal to clean up. And they did a proposal through Geologica, and they are delivered it to the water board. The water board need to accept or reject. Some people in the community see a problem in that, in that proposal. So we are here to listen what they have to offer, and we will say if we accept or not to recommend to the water board to accept or reject. I so don't let's pretend say, to be an expert, so I'm listening. But no, 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 I mean, know part of it, too, though, Beth, is to, to reinforce the sense of urgency that there's real world concerns out there on the street. So your presence here is very important to do this. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. I, I've lived here quite a long time, and there was a similar problem here at Chop Semiconductor across the freeway close. And they had bad pipes out there for years and years and years and years. And now it's called the Vineyards, which I think is kind of a crazy name for that development. But, um, I'm a little concerned about the, the liquor stores right there at Ground Zero. And here we have two, a, a couple who's been there forever. They're, they're wonderful people. And they're sitting on top of the plume. They're stuck. And they're stuck there. And the roof's falling down. And it doesn't seem like the, the owner of the property really gives a, about it. And somebody needs to be concerned about their welfare, too. Not only Casper Brenwood and the Sparrow Ranch and everyone around. Miller Creek, too. What's the effect there? This is probably a lot bigger than people are realizing. Well, the Kershaw yeah. property wasn't changed, wasn't fixed until somebody came in to buy it with money to clean it up. So it seems as though the purchase and change of ownership is that what drives the cleanup? It should be the reverse. Well, should we hear the rest of the thing? Yeah, yeah. 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 questions. These are all really good yeah. key questions. Yeah. Uh, so, moving along, uh, this is just uh, a close up of the area that we're going to be doing cleanup work. Uh, we'll be digging under the former dry cleaner and then. Uh, out in the parking area to the west of the dry cleaner, we'll be cutting trenches to cut off these uh, the soil vapor migration along these uh, utility alignments. So that is uh, work that will be happening as soon as, as the, this remedial action plan is approved by the uh, regional board. What is the brown in this map? Uh, the brown is this area here is the extent of the soil vapor, the PCE and soil vapor. And, uh, Dan, where's the so-called eastern hotspot? Eastern hotspot is out here, was out here. It's no longer a hotspot. Well, the question is, uh, why is that not slated for excavation <coughs> as well? Because it meets uh, soil cleanup standards. Uh, my theory of why we're still seeing so vapor concentrations out here is that it's it's coming off the dry cleaner itself. 
You but said, uh, you said there was something there before and it's not there now. Right. Well, it must have gone somewhere, I imagine. We treated it. That was the area that we treated. And we were, were able to get treatment product in, and we, we have tested the soil and found that it's the concentrations of uh, hydroxylene solvent have, have gone down to below the levels that uh, are required for the cleanup. So that part of the site, uh, the soil doesn't need treatment. It's, it's just under the dry cleaner that, that hasn't been treated yet. How often is that check, is that same spot checked? Is Quarterly? That, yeah, we're so still checking. Check. We're still checking. So how can you be sure that you're stopping? I mean, how, how much will you be able to continually watch those spots that where you think you've stopped it from coming, say, into Casa or across that street? Those, well, those, those, we'll, uh, those cut off after, we, after we do the excavation, we'll put in wells to monitor. So there'll be additional monitoring points mm -hmm. installed after we do the excavation to <coughs> monitor that. So and we will continue sampling to document that the concentrations go down. So we will continue watching that. So have you, have you cleaned up other situations like this? Yeah, there are dry cleaner sites. That, well, I know there. Are, yeah, so yeah. you've been involved in yes. this, and and are you still checking on those sites? Is that something that would be ongoing for us? It wouldn't be forever. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, we would we would check until we document that everything is is where it should be, mm -hmm. and then we'd ask to stop. But we would check. That and, that's in the plan. And how can you be sure that you've gone deep enough to really? Uh, to make sure you found all the damage. You can tell that from the monitoring data. If, if the concentrations don't go away, then we're stuck with something still there. So this isn't this isn't really easy to read on, on the big projector, but these locations out here are where we would have new groundwater monitored wells. There'd also be a new well at the location of the old dry cleaner. So, so we remove the soil and we install wells to monitor and we continue monitoring until regional board agrees that the, the problem has been resolved. What are the levels on the ranch? On the ranch, uh, the concentrations out here, we found uh, the highest is around 40 micrograms per liter of PC and groundwater. Uh, on the edge here, uh, it's around five. And how many times over is 40? I forget what the original number is, but say. The drinking water standard is five. Five. So 40 is a significant number. Do you have to level the center completely to take care of this? You can just dig under the dry cleaner and remove the soil. Feeding into the next slide. Yes. Uh, realistically, uh, because we'll be digging an excavation uh, 15 feet deep, uh, maybe a little deeper, right under the dry cleaning machine, that's going to require uh, a track hoe. And I can't drive a track hoe into that building. You know, we have to take the building down. We would take the building down and leave the slab. Uh, the demolition would be done by. Not the market. Not the market. <laughs> they're, they're actually two. Alex and Jen are just kind of screwed. They move out. They are tenants that will have to be moved oh, okay. to, to do that work. But those are two separate buildings. The, the, the buildings that the dry cleaner in is, is separate from the, the grocery store. Why didn't that schematic show how PCE hits on the south side? This edge here is at the drinking water standard, five parts per billion. Uh, we have detections, I think two detections below five parts per billion on the property, but we didn't include them in the edge because uh, they're below the, the cutoff. But it's important to point out that at present, you are seeing CE, so another um, I was just going to mention, you've also sampled several samples in the creek that were non-detect, and uh, as you mentioned earlier, you plan to do more delineation of the plume. Uh, 
in different directions <coughs> and the sample of the tree can get. So when you say it's five, is it PCE or PCE, uh, PCE to? Uh, on the edge here, yes. the, the sum is less than five. There's uh, PCE or PCE plus DCE? Plus, plus. All, all together. Yeah, all, all together. Yeah. PCE and the other. Yeah. Okay. You might mention the wellhead treatment. Uh, we also have installed a wellhead treatment system on one of the wells on the Sahara Ranch property. That is operating now, and we've tested it twice since it was installed. Uh, the first sample had, uh, I think it was 0.6 uh, micrograms per liter PCE uh, going into the system and nothing coming out. Uh, the second set of samples, nothing was detected in either sample, which is, uh, the detection limit is about 0.5, so 0 0.5, 0 0.6, it's, it's, it's a low concentration. <coughs> So these tests, do you, do you do all these tests in your van, or is that real accurate, or are they sent somewhere else to be confirmed? Uh, the water samples go to a, a fixed laboratory, and the, all these labs are state certified, so they are as ac accurate. They're not like a field kit. So it looks like the plume is like right up against the creek, but just not quite getting to it. Uh, if I can get back to that figure. I mean, as good as it seems to be going where no people are yet. Sure. And you might also want to the depths, too. The, the creek's at one level, the flume's at a deeper level. The, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the, the creek is, is um, generally above elevation uh, 10. And the zone where we see the PC in groundwater is deeper. It's just a quirk of the way that this solvent is moving in groundwater, but uh, it's it running below the creek. It could, could be getting diluted. And it could get diluted. Uh, the, the I mean, it's not going away. It's all somewhere there. Or in the air. Let's see if I can get back to the slides. All right. All right, so the plume may, may go under the creek at some point, but it, what we have so far is that it, it seems to be following a transect north of the creek, uh, and that's probably driven by geology. They're, they're, uh, the way uh, the gravels and sands were laid out long, long time ago uh, is, is, is driving the movement of the, of the plume and not what you see now. So is there any damage over on the other side of the creek? Or is there any testing over there? Other side of the creek to the south? Yes. Or the east. In the east. So uh, okay, well, that's, that's the next. The next. Yeah, why don't we, uh, uh, why don't we um, continue with Dan's and again, Believe me, most of the night tonight's going to be public comment. So, and I think you might have a, a broader context once we hear um, <coughs> the other presentations. Although these are great questions, by the way. So, thank you. But why don't we uh, keep going, Dan? So, this is, this is my last. Please slide. write down any questions you have, or, or again, clarifications. Feel free to uh, ask right now as well. Just one What do you mean that one, month one? When is month one? Which month one is when regional board approves the plan. But it is not in the process, in, the, in your proposal, this schedule. It's an attachment. It, it's in the, it's in the. Yeah. This is right out of the wrap. It's in okay. the yeah. remedial act. Uh, figure 18, 19. Yeah, so it's in the remedial act. Yeah, that's. Uh, there is preliminary work we have to do. There is a process for uh, demolishing the building, which we don't control. Uh, permits and, and uh, asbestos abatement and, and uh, getting approvals. But uh, once the building is taken down, we'll dig up the soil under the dry cleaner and, and uh, then begin monitoring. So you are, you are saying that after seven months, you want to clean up? 
apartments? You are saying that after seven months, you can see that you want to do the excavation. This, this could be shorter, it could be longer, it depends on how long it takes to get the building demolished. But, what do you mean but, longer? Well, that, is, that is what we, I mean. We estimated six months, this is, this is our plan. If we can get out there sooner, we'll get out there sooner. And how about if you get later? What the water board will do if they don't obey this timeline? We're, we're going to get to that in a minute. In my okay, yeah. let's, let's, let's keep moving. Let's hear the whole presentation, yeah. please. So, uh, that's all I have. Uh, All right, Dan, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we're going to hear from the toxicologist on potential exposure routes for proposed cleanup levels. What it means, uh, PC and toxicology. Oh, for, 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 oh, for her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, everyone now knows what PC is and routes, so we're, we're ready to hear get some more information um, on the specifics. Regina Linville. I'm a toxicologist at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. Um, we call it a WEHA. And I'm here tonight to talk about potential risks and impacts of PCE and breakdown products. So a WEHA is the lead state entity um, to evaluate human health impacts uh, due to chemicals in the environment. Um, oh, I'm sorry, next slide. Our expertise is in toxicology and risk assessment of chemicals. And when we're called in, it's usually to give a neutral and objective review of the science that uh, informs us about human health effects. Next slide, please. So in human health risk assessment, um, risk is a combination of toxicity and exposure. You have to have a toxic chemical present to have risk, and you have to have exposure to a person to have risk. Um, in human health risk assessment, we, fo we focus on the questions, are toxic chemicals present, where and how much? Are people exposed to toxic levels of the chemicals? And what are the potential health impacts due to the exposure related with the contaminated site? So tonight we're here to talk about contamination at the Marinwood Plaza Shopping Center, which you all know much more about than I do. Um, I do know that a previous dry cleaning operation released chlorinated solvents here. The solvent was tetrachloroethylene, which we'll call PCE. And we're concerned about that chemical and what we call the daughter products, which are really just the natural breakdown products uh, from that chemical. And we're interested in that chemical in soil, in soil vapor, in groundwater, and in indoor air. Next slide, please. So the question is, the first question is, are the chemicals toxic? And that's, um, the clear answer to that is yes, these are toxic chemicals. Um, uh, PCE and its breakdown products, which are shown here. And we're focused on the chronic human health impacts from ongoing exposures to these chemicals. We know that PCE can cause cancer in laboratory animals, and there is suggestive evidence that it can cause cancer in people. We know that two of the breakdown products, TCE and vinyl chloride, which is shown as VC up there, um, we know that those chemicals cause cancer in humans and in lab animals. And all of these chemicals can cause non-cancer hazardous effects. 
What are the hazardous effects? Such as what would the non-cancer effects? Well, the non-cancer effects, I'm going to go into that on the next okay. slide. <clears throat> so this site mainly has, next slide, sorry. Thank you. This site mainly has PCE. So I'm going to focus on PCE tox toxicity. And first I'll talk about cancer. Long-term exposure to PCE um, may increase the risk of cancer. Uh, high doses of PCE in laboratory rodents causes increased tumors in liver. And there is limited evidence that there may be an increased risk of cancer in people. And that comes from some studies I have tracked uh, workers in the dry cleaning industry. And from those studies, the conclusion is that there may be an increase in certain types of cancer in these people. The cancer is bladder cancer, blood system cancer, and lymphatic system cancer. But the evidence is not very strong for this. There's a lot of other things that could be causing this increase in cancer rates in these people. And these studies are unclear as to um, often the separation between people working in the dry cleaning industry and people working in the non-dry cleaning laundry industry. So there are a lot of unknowns with that. Um, <coughs> Non-cancer effects occur at higher doses. So the effects that we see in laboratory animals are in liver, uh, liver damage, and the effects that we see in people are at much higher doses and they're usually central nervous system effects. So we don't focus a lot on these non-cancer effects because by the time you get that level of exposure, you have a pretty significant cancer risk exposure. So when we clean up, when risk managers address contamination at the site for PCE, it's usually controlled by addressing cancer risk. So I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to explain how we estimate cancer risk for different dose levels of a carcinogen. Thank you. Um, this graph shows the relationship between an increased dose of chemical and increasing risk of a tumor. Now these three data points demonstrate a really important principle in toxicology, which is when we see a toxic chemical with a dose increasing, we see increasing observed effects. So many of our carcinogens that we assess the risk of, we have to depend on laboratory data and in lab rodents, and that is the case for PCE. So next slide, please. Um, in cancer bioassays, lab animals are exposed to increasing doses of a chemical for most of their lifetime. And then they are assessed after the experiment for whether or not they develop to, uh, tumors. So this graph shows three increasing doses with increasing occurrences of tumors. And next slide, please. We then take the relationship between those doses and the response that we call the dose-response relationship. We extrapolate that down to a very low dose that is associated with an extremely low probability of developing cancer. And that's how we determine a human dose. Um, and the human dose is what the screening levels are based on. The human dose is a safe dose, but I have to tell you toxicologists never ever want to say safe about anything. So really a human dose is, um, is a dose that we don't expect to cause harm. But really with this, it, it is associated with an extremely low probability of cancer. Next slide, please. Okay, so say we have this data. In this example, the lowest dose gave um, uh, cancer to 20% of the, of the mice. Uh, next slide, please. What we do next is we extrapolate down using that dose-response relationship, and we, to a level that would, um, instead of a 20% probability of cancer, would give a 0.0001% probability of cancer. And that is where we get that dose. And it's important to understand that in this system, the system of cancer risk assessment, there is never a zero probability of cancer unless you have absolutely no dose. So we consider any exposure to a carcinogen to have a risk, and we quantify that no matter how low that risk is. 
Next slide, please. So what does this cancer risk mean? First, I want to clarify a couple terms. Sometimes when you hear about these sites and risk assessments, you hear terms like one in a million cancer risk, 10 to the negative six cancer risk, and things like that. So I want to tell you that that percentage I just showed you, 0.0001% probability of developing cancer is the same as a one in a million chance of probability of causing cancer and the same of what we call 10 to the minus six. It's the same probability that we talk about in different ways. The cancer risk that we're discussing, that we, that we discuss in human health risk assessment, is the increase in probability of contracting cancer over a lifetime due to a specific exposure source. This is called the incremental lifetime cancer risk and it's abbreviated as ILCR. So an important thing to understand about this is that um, we don't have yes and no answers on cancer. We are working, there's no guarantee that an exposure will or will not lead to a cancer. What we do is we work with a probability continuum <laughs> and it's much in the way that I just explained. Um, and the probability increases with increasing dose. So the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, considers that one in a million probability of, of getting cancer to be a slight risk and a one in 100,000 probability, which we also call 10 to the minus five, um, as, a, as a very low risk. And US EPA and pretty much most of the toxicological authoritative bodies in the world agree with this. Um, in the United States, the typical person has a lifetime cancer risk of 35%. It's a 35% probability of developing cancer in your lifetime. So when we look at that and we add the one in a million probability that you might get from site, and this could be one in 100,000 or one in 10,000, you see that it's a fraction, a very low fraction of a percent. This is not to say that it's not important, these low exposures, and, um, but we have to be able to talk about it. We have to have a way to talk about these cancer risks and to um, really in risk assessment, it's a tool that's talking about probability so that we can compare risks, the magnitude of risks, for, an, for example, if we had a site that had one in 10,000 probability of developing cancer due to the exposure to that site, that's a probability of 0.01%. We would take that much more seriously than if we had a contaminated site that had the one in a million probability of developing cancer. That's how we use these probabilities. That's really their, their design there for um, risk managers to be able to understand risk. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Okay, now. So how much PCE is at this site and where is it? PCE is found at concentrations above our screening levels both on and off the site. And it's important to understand what we mean when we say our screening levels uh, the Regional Water Board uses um, environmental screening levels, ESLs, and what those, and they're similar to what's used in other areas as well, as far as the process. Um, these are chemical concentrations in environmental media that are expected to present a negligible risk for a specific human exposure. So this is important. The, in this case, all but one of these ESLs are calculated to protect people from the inhalation of PCE in indoor air. That's what the soil is based on. That's what the soil vapor is based on. And, um, and one of the groundwater um, screening levels. So it's important not to think that, this is, that we're talking about touching the soil or something like that. These soil, these, um, Environmental screening levels are designed to look at how much chemical is in a soil that moves into the soil gas and then moves into your house and, is, and then that you breathe in. So um, that's where these, these, that's the way these ESLs are developed. There is one ESL that is based on drinking water. If you look on the last, 
on the bottom row, in the last column, we have groundwater ESLs. We have one that's five, which was mentioned before, and that is the MCL for drinking water. Um, and we have the 63 micrograms per liter, which is the ESL for whether or not there's enough volatile chemical in that water to transform, vaporize into vapor, go up into soil, and go up into the house. Uh, next slide, please. So what are our exposure routes at this site? We have two exposure, possible exposure routes, inhalation, that could be indoor air or outdoor air, and ingestion, um, and that would be drinking water. So um, there's the, the groundwater on, under, and around the site is not used for drinking water, um, but there is a potential drinking water source on the adjacent or nearby ranch. Next slide. So now we know that toxic chemicals are present and that the exposure levels, that the exposure routes exist. So are people actually exposed to toxic levels of PCE? Well, the data shows exposure to one group, on-site workers in the liquor store. Um, they are breathing indoor air that is a little bit higher than our ESL. It's still very low risk, but it is higher than our ESL. And we would expect for that to change after the remediation. Um, residents are not being exposed to PCE and in indoor air based on the failure to find volatile organic chemicals in the soil gas throughout the neighborhood. like that chemical is not moving into the I, I mentioned before that I don't think that they were taking the samples in the right places as mentioned before. And I think that it's too risky to say that it's not in the fact in the just I, I think that it's too risky that it's taken in the government Uh-huh, yes. Yeah, I understand that. And that we hear that loud and clear. Okay, yeah, sure. yeah. Um, <coughs> Outdoor air is, uh, has been measured and, and they're at low levels. They're pretty much background levels for California and they are not at toxic levels. And the drinking water well on the nearby ranch had very low levels of PC in the well. It has higher levels in the groundwater aquifer, in the well low levels, and it received treatment. So from my perspective, when we look at human health, we look at that toxic chemicals present, exposure to people. We don't have that connection there. And, um, and that's why we don't consider risk. So what are the potential health impacts? Considering the lack of exposure, the potential impacts are few for the current scenario based on the data that we have. Um, commercial worker risk from inhalation of PCE and in indoor air is very low. The excess probability is about uh, 0.0003%. Um, and again, we didn't find any POCs in the residents and the drinking well has treatment. But we also want to think about future exposure potential. And um, of course, there's cleanup being proposed. The cleanup goals, the ESLs, um, they're very conservative, they're very protective, they're more strict than what's used through most of California. Um, and uh, 
Remediation is planned to remove the source material, as we've heard about, and to block vapor transit so that any new vapor might go into the neighborhood. Um, in my view, the most important factor for future exposure is putting new buildings on that site because there are some areas of the site that have high soil vapor, PCE, that aren't going to be remediated. And if in the future new buildings go on those areas, they should have a site-specific risk assessment to um, make sure that vapors are not going into those buildings. And that's it. Thank you. Testing any of the animals in the area, the moles or rats or anything, to see if there's any exposure to them. And since you, that's what you study is rats and things. You know, I mean, that's an interesting wouldn't question. it hit the animals first? I mean, they're rolling around in the dirt, they're right. drinking the water, they're breathing the air all day long. Or are there any animals there? Um, we wouldn't expect exposure to animals like that because these chemicals don't pass through the skin very well, so dermal exposure rolling in the dirt. If they ate a lot of contaminated dirt, that'd be a problem. And breathing outdoor air wouldn't be so much of a problem. But um, that is an important question in all of these kinds of situations, and that is treated separately as an ecological risk assessment, and it's usually not on rats, and well, it's usually on wildlife. So. Um, yeah. Are there any teratogenic effects of PCEs? Teratogenic? Yeah, are these all carcinogenic effects? Yeah, no, there's no, there haven't been any teratogenic effects of PCE, um, you know, discovered <clears throat> to this point. And we focus on cancer effects because we protect them at lower levels. So by the time we get to non-cancer effects, we're already very concerned about cancer effects. So, but there is, um, there is a problem with TCE, one of the breakdown products of PCE, where it can cause malformations of the heart in developing embryos, and um, we're, we take that very seriously, and, um, but we don't have TCE levels at this site. Have any of the previous employees of the dry cleaner or the hair cutting salon or anybody that worked in that center while this is going on, have they been tested for any residue? People who work there. Yeah, I do not know. And um, honestly, that doesn't usually happen in these situations. And it's not easy to detect? Um, not at these levels. Okay, <coughs> that's good. Thank you. We have one final question. Um, neither Stinker has mentioned the Marinwood market and its proximity to PCE. Is there any statement that can be made that would <clears throat> quiet us, those of us who are in there two, three times a week, not yes. to mention products and the people who work there? That's a very good question. I myself was very curious about this and talked to the water board about it, and um, they were able to provide me with some past data from many years ago where they did test the indoor air in, um, mar in the market, and it was um, non-detect. And they tested, I believe, outdoor air around the market. We wouldn't really expect much in outdoor air. But I'll tell you one thing about, um, yeah, that <coughs> when we talk about, even, even if you went in the liquor store several times a week, you don't have anywhere near the same kind of exposure that a worker would. So right. it is much of 
focus on the board first. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, next we're going to hear a uh, summary of the proposed cleanup um, for soil, groundwater, and vapor and proposed schedule. Um, we, we already went through that. Dan, 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 Dan. I accidentally did that. Okay, Dan. Let's <laughs> <laughs> we'll cir we'll circle back with you as you get on that. Um, so, Regional Water Board. Yep, next. Okay, Stephen, welcome. Hi, I'm, I'm Stephen Hill with the Water Board, and I'd like to give you a little bit of a uh, little bit of background on the regulatory aspects, and then talk about the review process for this cleanup plan. Uh, for background, uh, we use the Water Code and associated regulations and policies for park cleanup of contaminated sites. Uh, there are two sections of the Water Code that we make a lot of use of. Uh, one section, 13267, allows us to require reports and Section 13304 allows us to require cleanup. We use both these tools at this site. Uh, we've issued a site cleanup order for the site in uh, 2014, and we issued an amendment to that order uh, later that same year. Uh, taken together, they require the current landowner, Marin, Marinewood Plaza LLC, to complete a site investigation, implement some interim cleanup actions, submit a, a, a RAP, remedial action plan that you've heard about, and implement the RAP once we approve it. The landowner did submit a draft wrap by January 1st, which was the deadline established in the site cleanup order. Uh, and the, the uh, consultant through the landowner, uh, Dan, has just given you a, a, an overview of that, that wrap. Uh, task 6 of the order provides a yardstick for our review of the draft wrap. And I'll just summarize the key points. Uh, the wrap must propose remedial work, that means cleanup, that has a high probability of eliminating unacceptable threats to human health and restoring beneficial uses of water in a reasonable time, with reasonable time based on the severity of the impact. The RAP must evaluate alternative approaches to cleanup in terms of projected cost, effectiveness, benefits, and impacts on public health, welfare, and the environment. And the executive officer of the Water Board should consider the success of interim remedial actions in reducing the potential threat when evaluating the proposed uh, cleanup schedule. So we've completed an initial review of the draft wrap. We're going to take comments and consider them before we take any final action. But based on that initial review, uh, we're pleased to see a couple of features that Dan mentioned. The proposal to remove the solvent impacted soil below the, the dry cleaner. Uh, and that's not contingent on site redevelopment at, at this point. We're also pleased to see a proposal uh, to block any vapor intrusion in the utility trenches protect nearby residences. Uh, so far we see three deficiencies in the draft wrap. I'll just touch on those briefly. It needs to address potential odors that might occur during the soil excavation. It needs to address stormwater runoff prevention during the excavation. We don't want muddy water flowing off the site. And it needs to evaluate active groundwater cleanup options to demonstrate if, they're, if they are feasible and appropriate. We still have levels over uh, drinking water standards over at the Silvera Ranch. Um, let me turn to the RAP review and approval process. Um, this is not a one-size-fits-all process. It can be simple or complex depending on the significance of the contamination and the level of public interest. And our process for this site is going to be more robust because of the high level of public interest. Uh, in January, we announced the draft RAP uh, available, availability to interested persons, uh, including nearby residents, and we started a 30-day public comment period. Uh, which runs through February 22nd. So that's the deadline? Yes. That's yeah. the current deadline for getting written, written comments to us. Of course, we're taking them today. Uh, and we can extend that period if necessary. Uh, after the comment period, we'll review the comments and we'll determine what action should be taken on the draft draft. And we have three options, really. We can approve it. We can approve it with conditions if it has minor problems. Or we can reject it if it has fundamental problems. If we reject, reject the draft draft, this opened up the possibility of enforcement action, including fines of up to $5,000 per day. Regardless of the action that we take, we'll provide written responses to all the comments received. Um, in terms of the process, the length of the process, I've described something that, that uh, is probably going to take uh, several weeks after the comment period is closed. But again, it sort of depends on what we get, and whether we wind up approving the plan or not. 
I'd also like to mention what happens after the RAP is approved. Task 7 of the site cleanup order proposes to complete, excuse me, uh, requires implementation of the approved RAP according to the schedule proposed in the RAP and approved by the Executive Officer of the Water Board. The draft RAP proposes to complete the active cleanup tasks within about eight months, as you saw in Dan's slide. If we conclude that that schedule is too vague or too long, we can either reject the RAP or we can establish a revised schedule and an update to our site cleanup order. Those, those are our options. In closing, I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we're interested to hear your comments. Uh, we hope this forum tonight provides you an opportunity to find out more about the project, uh, ask questions, and, and provide us with some comments. Uh, so at this point, we're done with the presentation part. Uh, we'd like to open it up to, to uh, questions, comments. Uh, Will the proposed wrap come before the full board for consideration at any time? It can. It depends on, again, the comments we receive. If we sense that there's significant concerns about the wrap, then we would be more likely to bring it to the board either as a status report or as a item to be approved in a uh, I'm puzzled by the comment. I can say I'm ready for the cleanup now, but you had options. Uh, I don't understand the wrap, some of that stuff. I'm listening, but if you just want us to comment and say, please proceed with the cleanup? No. So what we want is any questions you have, some of them are being answered to the extent possible this evening. If not, they will be answered as part of the public comment process, which, as Stephen mentioned, everything will be responded to. <laughs> We also want to hear your concerns. Um, we want to hear anything on your mind related to this. And again, if you go home and think about something else next week, current deadline, February 22nd. The public comment process, um, again, is a legal process that they formally respond to. Again, I'll just give them a quick plug they're taking it also that step further here because I think we're recognizing, we being collectively everyone involved, the seriousness of this and the concerns out there. So they've come to us as well as part of that process. Let me add on to that too. Uh, there's two types of cleanup. There's a problem that's, that's affecting people right now. We require what I call interim cleanup. And some of that's already happened uh, because it's either, well, actually, because it was easy to do and we wanted to see project progress made. This is now sort of the, the, the finishing up, I would, I would term it. If the site's not fully cleaned up, but as you, as you heard from uh, our, our OE toxicologist, we don't see any current exposure, so we have a little luxury of time to make sure we choose a, a good cleanup plan. And that good in the sense of being effective, being acceptable to the community, and all the other factors that we're supposed to consider. Won't the site be more uh, favorable for someone to bid on development and changes if it's cleaned up, rather than waiting for a proposal for someone to come in and build it and clean it? Yes, and that's what we have in front of us now. It's a proposal to clean it up, regardless of redevelopment. And I think we all agree with that statement that it needs to be done. Um, downtown Santa Clara doing a toxic cleanup with some part that's being tested. And they mentioned that you mentioned one of the things that's locking on the current plan was, you know, keep, is there anything that the air warm walls being cleaned? So would that be something that would be part of the plan? Was there anything to be more airborne when they're actually doing the cleanup? We will ask them to look at that. Uh, it's rare to see these sites tented because usually there's just not enough uh, mass of, of stuff to get into the air that causes an either unsafe condition or, or noxious odors. But we're going to require that that be uh, you know, uh so that they have monitoring, they have an ability to slow things down or adjust things to make sure they don't cause a problem. My question addresses the discrepancy in the depth of excavating. Evidently, the plan is to excavate a 10 by 10 area to a depth of 15 feet. Um, but we've been told that um, PCEs can be found at a depth of 35 feet at least. I'm going to probably turn that over to Dan in terms of 
what's what's where on the site. Uh, I think we may be mixing apples and oranges if we're talking about soil contamination, which doesn't you know, typically think of it being above the water table versus groundwater contamination, which extends below the water table. I'll tell you what, let's hold that thought because I know several of the speakers are going to raise that issue. Let's tee it up and then I think we've identified Dan as the right person to address that. So we've got that one in mind. Okay, any other further preliminary? Questions? Yeah, just a quick question for, for Mr. Hill. Um, you mentioned a moment ago a significant portion of response in the public comment period. How do you define that? Can you quantify that? Not really. Um, I think one yardstick would be is this thing going to get petitioned to our State Water Resources Control Board after we act? <coughs> if the answer is yes, then we'll, we'll take our time and make sure we do it carefully and we probably bring it to our board. Could you ballpark that for me? Are we talking, to, you know, what, what what kind of volume would typically end up escalating in that form? It would depend on the type of comments. Okay. So not, not necessarily volume per okay. se, but the the type of comments that are raised and the level of uh, discomfort or disagreement that exists between what we proposed to adopt, which we haven't done yet, we're still reviewing the same plan that we've distributed to everyone else. So, I mean, we're, we're looking at things like the feasibility, but we're also really thinking about the time frame because we all want to move, move forward and whether, if there's areas where there seems to be disagreement within the community or within the scientists, then we could parse off that piece and move forward on other actions. There's a bunch of different ways in which this can move forward, but if, if, if there's a strong desire to have a, a, a public hearing, then we will, we will hold the public hearing, but hopefully we can answer your questions now and, and, and throughout this process. There's always also certainly availability from all of our staff by phone conversation or if a small group wanted to come down and meet with us or go over technical information, we're happy to, to do that as well. The Regional Water Board is a state agency that needs an outline. It's appointed by the governor, and your meetings are held. Once, once a month, the second Wednesday of the month. But we have to notice these in advance, so they'll be due notice as well. But we, we first want to gauge where, where, where the issues are, if there are indeed issues. <coughs> yes, two very quick notes. Tenting is not an issue. Someone brings that up and says, no, we need to stop this at the tenant. We've said that's not necessary. And then the second one is, if the tenants, Alex and Jen, the don't have a place to go, if they say, what are we going to do? We can't lose our business. Is that going to stop the development and the cleanup? The cleanup. I don't care about the development. Is there a plan a for the question. tenant who has the, to move? Uh, the landowner's representative. I understand there's a lease arrangement with the paper uh, store operator. I can't address the specific lease terms with the tenant. There's confidential information between the tenant and the landlord. But I, I can't say that that's co that possibility of them vacating is addressed in the lease. So that's not a holdup. It won't be a holdup. Got a question in that. Uh, yeah, it's to have to tie on to her question. Is there a contingency plan that? Once this this remediate or once this wrap or this this uh, the outline of the existing project and, and cleanup takes place, that testing is done once that's all done, and if there's if there's more that wasn't found or, or removed, that that will be added on to the project. Uh, yeah, we always want to see empirical results afterwards to make sure it was effective. Uh, plans are nice. Execution is great, but we want to see that, for instance, the soil gas numbers stay down after the excavation occurs under the building. Or in the case of the uh, the offsite groundwater plume, we want to see that that start to decline. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is if the, the owner feels that the amount of investment to take care of this as they see it now, and then once that's all taken care of, there they don't just get signed off. That there might be a dip, double the cost. That's right. We're, we're basically requiring performance, not implementation of a particular project. So, so why don't we go? Um, PCE's been around in this site for a while. It's well known. 
and now it's become this big head. Is it because bridge pulled out and now that the property's on the market and Marcus and Millicap is actually actively marketing this piece of property? Because I do understand that it isn't that in fact the case, is that it is on the market and I'm wondering if that's actually what's pushing this to be cleaned up. No, it's not. Um, my understanding it is, is it is on the market, but um, the factors pushing it are the uh, level of concern and the fact that it's gone on for too long and needs to be taken care of. So they, I think that they brought some presentation to clarify some point that some people of the community have and share with the other people, are we going to have opportunity to do that presentation? To have the presentation? Yeah. We have the presentation. Have, yeah. Oh yeah, so Stephen Ness, so everyone, another one of your neighbors um, is taping the proceeding. Yeah. I think that can clarify some of the questions. And Dave Schotter's got that presentation too on. Well, I didn't understand your question, but so, once we're done with these preliminary questions, I, I have a few ideas on how we can proceed. Yeah, yeah. yeah just as a point of clarification, I want to draw the distinction between this as a public meeting or a public hearing. Any comments we make today, will they be admitted to the record, or do we have to submit those in writing for them to be in the record? Great question. That will be recorded, that is being recorded, and it will be delivered on memory stick to Ralph Heimer next week. In writing. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than in writing. You well, don't have to yeah, I'm not have to so the, we, we, would, we would really encourage you to submit something in writing. Um, if so we, don't have to we, we have some cards here. If you want to even submit something initially in writing or you would like us to call you and get back to you if you have questions, you can certainly do that. But it's but an email to Ralph Lander qualifies as communicating, not a handwritten letter. No, 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 it certainly does. And the fact sheet that I pointed out, which we have copies of here, also has the contact information for Ralph, the email address, <laughs> lots more information. So I'd encourage you to take that too. But, but we'd like to have you know, some of a record and we'd like to be able to really clearly understand your comments. And we do have to finish. So, Dan, real quickly, uh, the plume goes underneath the freeway, so that's Caltrans property. Is that going to have an impact on the process, the length of the process, how the process is <coughs> done? Does Caltrans have to sign off on it? They're not easy to work with. I would agree with that. <laughs> but we're talking about Caltrans uh, employees in the audience, but um, in this particular case, I don't think the difficulty of access under the freeway will actually be an impediment. The major sources of pollution are well away from the freeway, so we have good access there. Um, the only type situation where it might be an issue is if we do the cleanup near the, the source, under the dry cleaner building, and, and as Dan has already described, at the eastern hot spot, and, and there's still enough stuff that's gotten away from that area that's going to keep the groundwater over the ranch at an elevated level. Uh, if that's the case, then, then there would be a need for some type of cleanup to address that aspect. And, and then the Caltrans right away may be a little bit of an obstacle. But I think we can still work around that. There's property on either side. So is that the barrier that the Silvera people asked for, a barrier to stop the leaching in their property? Does that stall this cleanup, or is that just an additional part? Uh, I think it sort of depends on, on whether it's proposed and, and where and stuff like that. I think we're still in the talking stage. Uh, I understand that the Mr. Trotter is going to make a presentation and touch on that. Any other preliminary questions? Yes. Uh, the, the previous speaker mentioned at the very end um, something about a concern of new buildings being put up and then having contamination with those buildings. Why wouldn't the land underneath for new buildings? Why wouldn't that land be cleaned up as well? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and I think, Dan, you might be able to answer. So the toxicologist suggested there might still be some issues when new buildings are put over certain parts of the soil. Are you aware of that? The, uh, the RAP addresses that uh, in that uh, we would be monitoring mainly be so vapor quality because the excavation should address any exceedances of the soil quality standards. But 
uh, at the time, depending on when people want to put up houses on the property, there may be residual. Well, you're jumping ahead. And so, <laughs> and in that case, we'd be monitoring, and the most likely uh, result would be that the buildings would have to have a vapor barrier, which is a uh, impermeable membrane put under the building uh, with a uh, collection system to divert the vapor underneath to the rooftop. So the houses would be built with that knowledge. There, there are two possibilities here. If, if all of it, the mass really is under the dry cleaner building and you excavate it, <coughs> the, the halo of soil gas around it you will dissipate. And so everything drops. If, if there's somehow some sort of bits of the pollution that manages to migrate a little bit away, you might still have some high soil gas. Um, that's one of the things we'll evaluate as we're reviewing the, the, the raft, and that's one of the things we'll require monitoring to demonstrate. After the cleanup with the monitoring wells, how long afterwards does it have to be monitored? Is it going to be monitored for months or years or forever? Or when does it stop? For groundwater, it'll be years. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there's no current exposure. Uh, we have wellhead treatment on the one well that has been impacted at a low level. But uh, groundwater takes a while for the cooler break. Okay, yes, why don't we do two more, and then again, we'll circle back to everyone. Um, one thing I'm curious about, we've all been talking about talking on whether or not we agree with what's going in the RAP, and whether the RAP should be approved. What I'm curious about is, if it was approved today, at what point would it start to be implemented? That's a great question. As it's proposed in the draft RAP, if it was approved today, um, the active cleanup portion would be done in roughly eight months. That means the excavation under the, uh, the former dry cleaner building, that means the, the, the vapor cutoff trenches, um, mm -hmm. and additional monitoring wells to, to see what's going on with the groundwater. That's the length of time of execution. What I'm saying is, is there some binding action on the owner to force him to start the cleanup once it's Yes, there is. There's the site cleanup order that I mentioned earlier in my comments. Task 7 says that the, the cleanup has to happen according to the schedule proposed in the draft wrap and <coughs> approved by the executive officer of the water board. So, so that's that's the hook. Thank you. Very good question. I think we had one more, and then again, we'll have plenty of time. But not exactly related directly, but is there any historical uh, cancer rate data about this area? Anywhere? There, there is a, a, a state cancer registry that keeps track of that information, um, and we have put some of your, your fellow residents in touch with some of the resources at the state and, and, and federal level. I think the feds have a, a, a comparable agency. Um, as a practical matter, we look forward to try and fix problems and avoid future exposure, so, so it's not really something that we do on a regular basis to go back and look at the health data. Okay, so now we're going to have an open forum, and what I propose is we start out um, the Silvera family and their representative, Mr. Trotter, would like to do about a five to ten minute presentation. Uh, Bill McNicholas and his team are looking at about a 10 to 15 minute presentation. Um, I think you'll find that this will all build our knowledge base further. Um, these folks have been very intimately involved in different aspects. Then let's just pass a couple microphones around and, and really, again, questions, concerns, comments, everything on the table. So, um, Dave, why don't you start? Thanks, Damon, very much. Appreciate this opportunity to address the group here tonight. Uh, my name is David Trotter. I'm an attorney representing the Silvera family. And just as an aside, uh, I had my own city council meeting I was supposed to be at starting at 7 o'clock tonight, so I'm missing my own council meeting where I'm an elected official. Uh, so I'm happy to be here in Marin. I practice law over in Tonkos County. Um, the Silvera family has reviewed the proposed RAP. They have a number of comments and serious concerns with respect to the RAP and its proposed response to the off-site migration 
of PC of the PCE plume, which has contaminated the groundwater on their property. And the Silvera's comments are supported by a technical review of the RAF, which has been undertaken by Fred Clark, who is a professional geologist uh, with the Source Group Inc. And Mr. Clark's written comments on the proposed RAF will be submitted to the Water Board in a separate letter in the next few days. And I'm going to be speaking to some of the points that he has based upon his technical review. But the key point here is this. The monitored natural attenuation, which they refer to as MNA, that's being proposed in the RAF is a passive and we believe insufficient response to the residual PCE and other uh, vol volatile organic compound contamination that is both en route to the, the, the Silvera property and is already within the soils and groundwater on the site. And so Stephen, when you talk about the fact that there is contamination, probably, most likely there is contamination east of the eastern hotspot on the state of California property along the Highway 101 corridor and there's no containment for it at the present time and it's headed toward our client's property. That gives us some concern. So we're very pleased that, that in your presentation you indicated that one of the deficiencies that the Water Board staff sees is that there's not active remediation being proposed for the groundwater that's on site <coughs> and already on the Silvera property. That's a very important point for us. And there are a number of reasons why we believe that, uh, that, that, um, that MNA is not a sufficient response. Uh, and let me just talk about a few of them. The first is that the attenuation is dependent on a number of different factors, and these include uh, completion of the in situ soil remediation and reduction of PCE levels, which still hasn't happened fully on site. Um, and so when that hasn't happened, that increases the risk that there will be additional migration from the, the impacted site that will eventually get off site, go underneath the state of California property, and head on east with the prevailing groundwater. So the notion that MNA, that you just sort of monitor it and see what happens, that's a concern. And there's also concern about timeliness. Um, Mr. Clark's done some calculations, which will be shared. But basically, he calculated that the, the length of the plume currently from the source to the, to the, the full extent of the plume on the Silvera property is about 1,950 feet. And if you make some assumptions about the, the groundwater gradient here, which is very shallow, which means it doesn't go very fast, and you do some calculations and some assumptions based upon the soils that are subsurface, his calculation is that, that for the amount of water that's in that 900, that 1,950 feet, the amount of time it would take for that to all turn over and go past the Silvera property is approximately 30 years. Oh. Okay, that's 30 years that conservatively we're talking about potentially having monitored natural attenuation, and it could be longer if, in fact, the, the pores in the soil are not as or tighter pores. Water doesn't move as fast and can take longer than 30 years. But his assumptions are based upon medium, medium, you know, grain sand, which is probably the most likely prevailing condition on site. So that's that's issue one with respect to time. The second concern that we have is that there's no data that's been presented in the RAP for the purpose of discussing uh, appropriate bioremediation techniques to eliminate the VOCs, which would be the only way you could do anything active. That would be bioremediation of one kind, we believe. Uh, there's no study of soil types. There's no studies of groundwater chemistry or bacterial type and counts. That's not presented in the RAP or the feasibility analysis. And in that regard, here's something that we believe is significant. Mr. Clark believes is significant. Uh, it's that the PCE daughter products, the thing, the breakdown products, it goes from PCE to TCE to, to cysts, to ethyl chloride, so vinyl chloride, and then finally to something that's not carcinogenic. Um, the concern here is that based upon the current groundwater data that they've gotten, uh, it doesn't appear that those breakdown products are appearing in very large uh, concentrations at the present, present time. They're basically stuck at PCE. They don't seem to go past the 1-2 the, the PCE. And the concern here is that you know, again, that, that supports the 
indication in the data, which has not been adequately set forth in the RAP, that monitored natural attenuation will take decades to achieve. And frankly, that's not a reasonable outcome for the Silvera family um, because they have an impacted down gradient property owner. They depend on their groundwater for the domestic water wells serving their facility, their employee homes, and their livestock. And frankly, it's, it's an impact to their land. And so the notion that there, there be, could be decades of monitored attenuation and it doesn't actually work, and there's nothing in this wrap that requires an active remediation solution. That's not something that is acceptable to them. And Mr. Clark in his comments would has, have suggested ways to reduce that cleanup time from a few decades to perhaps several years, which would seem to us to be more reasonable. And that approach is exactly the kind of thing that's been used and followed at other sites in California and can and should be employed in this case. Uh, we believe that the, the water board should require several lines of treatment zones perpendicular to the flow of the groundwater uh, and that those be uh, appropriately placed. There could be one to the east of the eastern hotspot. There should be one uh, on or at the property line between Caltrans and the Silvera Ranch. Places where you put in place, you know, injection materials that the groundwater has to pass through and hopefully that will result in uh, this uh, attenuation actually occurring so that we get to uh, results for these VOCs that are below the drinking water standard of five parts per billion. And the, the point here is that right now, because of the nature of the way things have gone uh, with uh, both Rindman Plaza and their environmental consultant, um, we really don't have as good an understanding of the groundwater chemistry and bacterial makeup uh, in the soils there. That would have to be acquired and analyzed. Hasn't been done yet. Seems to me it should be done. Uh, that'll be another uh, comment made by Mr. Clark. Uh, and again, those kinds of active bio-remediation zones and barriers have been routinely applied in other places in California uh, with good success at reducing the dissolved phase VOC load in shorter time frames, and this is all about time. Three decades is not, is not a reasonable period of time. There's a question at the back. I, I'm going to go over my comments, and then I'll, I'll answer your questions if you have any, although I'm not really necessarily the right person to be answering those questions. Um, some other minor points, but significant points to the Silvera family. One is that the RAP should provide a guarantee of continuing and long-term wellhead treatment for any groundwater development north or south of the creek, if that's something that the Silvera family needs since such wellhead treatment is already called out for in the one well south of the creek. And the water board should expressly require that all financial and operational costs of such wellhead treatment are to be borne by Marinwood Plaza and or any successor in interest after the site is sold. And then finally, although no contaminants have been found in another creek to date, the plan on the raft to sample further downstream is important this is because the current sample points may not be below the actual interception of the plume within the, with the creek. And if the creek is threatened, then as a sensitive receptor, a more aggressive approach to remediation and protection would be in order. So I'll come back to what I said earlier. The water board should require implementation of more active remedial measures to reduce PCE levels in the groundwater to compliant MCLs and to reduce the corresponding time frame for that to occur which after all, the stated goal of, this, of the RAP and for this project site is to get, into the RAP is to get to below five parts per billion, and there's no actual measures proposed in the RAP to get there. All they're talking about is monitoring it, and we don't think that's sufficient. So I would be happy to answer any questions, but frankly, yes, sir. Please. Simple one. I understand your concerns. And the 22nd is the deadline. You've made your statement public, which is a real concern. How does that impact what happens after February 22nd? If you continue to dialogue, does that take this out another year before something's done? Or does the work start? And then as they go through and remove everything, they work on taking care of all the testing downstream and all, all of your personal concerns, which I respect. All right. We're going to be submitting written comments on time by the, by the 22nd. We're just members of the public like everybody else. Correct. Then, then, then it's in the hands of the water board. What will happen? 
Well, and I, and I think that started too early and will certainly be a good end point, like what happens from here. Dave, I thought you raised a great uh, point about uh, monitored natural attenuation, something I also raised in my letter. Um, I think at some point we'll want to hear more about what that is um, and what, uh, and I think the regional water board can speak to that. So, so Renee has a few. Okay, absolutely, Renee. Well, do we have to actually vacate at 530 or what's our conference? I think we're good on time. So I'd like to invite my client. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock lights out. I would like to invite my client, Renee Silvera, to make a few statements. We'll make a brief, a brief comment. Thanks very much for being here tonight. Um, I just want to footnote um, Dave's presentation and say that my family very much cares about the, the plaza area itself and the Casa Marin neighborhood as well. My dad's father got started in dairying um, at the Miller Ranch, which is right where the plaza is now. That's actually where the old dairy facility was. So my dad's father um, leased that dairy for many, many years before he bought the property over on the other side of the freeway. My mom and I live in Redwood. My dad died in 2012. So the community is very, very important to us. We're just not fixated just on our property. But it is a monumental thing for us. We're actually horrified at the amount of time that it has taken the property owner to address the situation. We were contacted in April, um, January 2013, and we were told that they were aware of their environmental um, issue in 2007. They reported it to the board in 2008. I just, you know, I can't express how irresponsible and unaccountable I think that is of the Greenwood Plaza owner not to have stepped to the plate and done the right thing for the community. It's just really, really inexcusable. inexcusable. I would just like to add that um, when we were approached by this, we tested our well in April of 2013 and we were really, you know, kind of spooked by the whole thing. And we got a non-detect on the PCE. We did, again, a test it in February of 2015. There was interim testing done uh, um, by Geologica, but in 2015, we, um, that's when they were doing all the drilling on the property, starting with the December 2014. February 2015, we again tested our well non-detect. In July 2015, Geologica had the that well tested, and that's when we started to pick up the PCE. So you can see in five months alone, we are seeing things happening. And so time is of the essence. We cannot have any more delays. And we hear tonight that um, they are going to proceed. But it's about time, and we are going to be pushing for a multi-pronged approach. Nothing should hold up something else. They need to take care of this mess and do it quickly and efficiently and completely. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Renee. Um, you're so much more emotional and therefore more effective speaker than I am. Um, there's one other point though. The, during the presentation by Geologica, they showed the extensive boom and it was all north of Miller Creek. But since we're now getting hits, we are getting low level hits south of Miller Creek. The plume delineation on the map is where the mass of the product is, but in fact, the plume is broader than the mapping. I just wanted to point that out. All right, thank you. So, Bill, why don't you tee up? Right. Um, give us 10 to 15 minutes. Ready to go, Steve. And we're, we're keeping some key questions in mind for the end of death. And what's this MNE process all about, et cetera? So. All right, uh, we're the group here. We have uh, several of us here tonight. We've been working on this thing for the last year and a half. Uh, we're going to go through and give you a little education on what PCE is, some of our comments on the uh, RAP, that's Remedial Action Report, what our feelings are. We're going to go into, we have Dr. Beth Keller, PhD in Chemistry, who is going to speak on, give you an information on what monitored natural attenuation is. Because you keep hearing the term, it's all through the wrap, everything. You don't, might not have an idea what it is. 
I'm going to pick up, talk a little bit about what the wrap does or doesn't do, and Ray Day is going to wrap up and talk about the soil vapor problems we experience here. Steve? Um, I don't think so. Maybe. Hang on here. So my name is Stephen Nessel. I run the website uh, SaveMarinewood.org. I've posted a lot of videos and links to EPA documents and what have you. Um, I encourage you to go uh, to it. I'm not allowed to, to post links on Nextdoor. Um, if you have a problem with that, talk to Bruce Anderson. He's here. But um, I, I'm we, we, we've been dedicated to getting the information out and a number of us uh, in this room have been following this since 2013. I brought a uh, couple props with me. This is my toxic waste. This is two pounds of toxic waste. And uh, this blue tarp over here, this is about 10 by 10 feet. And if you can imagine going up to the ceiling, that's about the volume of material that, that uh, Geologica is proposing uh, get removed and treated. And I believe uh, that facility, the dry cleaning facility, is probably about as much volume as this gym. So um, this is kind of the Mr. Science portion of the program. We're going to run through this quickly, but uh, hopefully it'll help you understand um, in layman's terms what's going on. Why should you be concerned uh, about PCE? Um, it's, uh, it's highly hazardous. Uh, EPA uh, has recognized it as a possible carcinogen. And, even, and the products, uh, as we've heard from the uh, epidemiologists, are even more toxic. Um, it's a Pandora's box of problems. Um, some of the problems, and this is straight from the uh, EPA website, cancer, kidney, liver damage, skin radishes, development until, uh, problems in children, nervous system damage, cough, throat, uh, irritation, miscarriages, asthma, chronic bronchitis. It's not something you really want to be around. In fact, only a few drops of PCE will poison an entire swimming pool. Any amount of PCE is a big problem. And this is going to be critical. So um, what I did was take some clips from 2013. Good. <laughs> That's not going to happen. You might need to go into presentation mode to be able to show the video. Presentation mode is to the Okay. Okay. Well, that's okay. So, um, well, Actually, most of these demonstrations were, were short video clips. Uh, the first demonstration was to show you, this is a, a, has a specific gravity of 1.4, and you pour it in water and it sinks like lead to the bottom. It sinks, uh, the PCE is, is 1.6, and what that means is when this goes down into the ground, it keeps going and going and going until it gets to uh, an impermeable surface, which in our case may be uh, the bedrock, but also because our bedrock around here is actually fractured shale, um, there's also water down there, and it all creates a big problem. This, you know, I'll put some of this stuff up, up on the website. Um, but uh, I, I have a groundwater model to show you how it works. Now, in 2013, if you went to the meeting, we were presented with uh, a couple bits of information. 
there was only, uh, it was uh, characterized as a small contained area, only two uh, spots. Through testing, through Renee and Bill and other people uh, pressing the issue, we got more testing going on. And we kept testing outward and outward and outward. And so far, you can see from those two little spots, if you want to point those out, the former dry, dry cleaner, uh, we now have toxic, uh, okay, toxic, toxic uh, you know, from here, two little spots. It's all the way out past, basically past the pumpkin patch. Um, so this is a very, very large uh, situation. Now, uh, we know that it is concentrated uh, in the hot spot areas, but um, because of the nature of the solvent, it goes everywhere and uh, it spreads out and it's sticky and um, it creates problems for decades, if not addressed. Um, they will only dig a hole this size for that entire area, and I don't know how many acres that is, but it's a lot of acreage. And we're talking about a very small uh, bunch of soil. In fact, it's our judgment that this uh, plan is basically scratching the surface. We know that the PCE has been detected at a 35 foot depth. That's 15 below, feet below the water level uh, at the lowest uh, water table uh, time of the year. So it goes deep. Uh, the, the dry cleaner has been around for 40 years. Um, and if you believe, in 40 years time with dripping pipes, this is the only quantity that would drip uh, from pipes and what have you. Well, you have more faith than, not, than me because I spill more on my tie uh, than, than would be on this. So, um, oh, well, we could get something. So here, this is basically a, a run through of everything. It shows how the, uh, uh, the plume is spread. It's spread uh, horizontally, but also vertically through uh, the aquifer. And when it gets into the aquifer, it poisons the water and it creates a huge problem in the entire area. The other problem is, is as this degrades, it creates uh, toxic soil vapors, which rise up through the soil. And if you live in Casa Marinwood, you need to be uh, particularly concerned about this. And lastly, lastly, go ahead. Um, and lastly, there's the health effects. And, uh, as you can see, gastrointestinal, um, hematological, and neurological uh, problems associated with this. Nasty stuff. So our concern, this is a very expensive problem. Our concern is uh, the money is to drive this and not you know, the, the, uh, the health needs and the environmental needs of the community. And that's all I have. Uh, well, we want a complete remediation, not partial fix, fi fixes. And um, the other point I did want to raise that there's been no active remediation since 2011, although the bio still is working. Uh, it, you know, basically it's been put on hold. So uh, we have to get started right away on this. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm going to move right on to Dr. Beth Keller, PhD, chemistry, and has done all of our, a lot of our expertise on the PCE and all the things. And she's going to speak to you on monitored natural attenuation and give you what it really is since it's been discussed, but it hasn't been explained. Thank you, and I'm going to take up this strong accent. I hope. I wrote a lot of things, so you don't need to follow my talk. Um, I want to share with you that... Um, we're at 
30 minutes total, so keep it to Okay. I want to share with you that I was very happy back in November, December, to sit uh, with a lot of people that are here to try to resolve this problem. And I am thinking that we are very close to doing it, but not yet there. And when I say that we are not yet there, we advance a lot, we have a proposal on the table, but the proposal has to be seen very careful because it's a lot of point, or at least three, four points that have to be reviewed in my point of view. So, can you the presentation away, please? So, uh, oh, yeah. from geological proposal, uh, they are suggesting to do a monitor natural attenuation, which means is that the groundwater will be monitoring. So this is part of whatever they are proposing, that the groundwater uh, will be monitoring, and they will demonstrate with the time that attenuation is happening, and it will, the way that can happen attenuation can be via of casting, elimination, diluition, or reductive dechlorination. <coughs> when they're talking about uh, MNA, or monitor natural attenuation, refer and demonstrate that natural attenuation process to achieve a specific remedial objective within a time frame. And I address more or less what David mentioned before, uh, that uh, is not a study of time frame that will happen. And this time frame has to be comparable with other methods, otherwise it doesn't work, the natural remediation. So the natural attenuation process is, again, uh, in its uh, natural process, uh, occur when physical, chemical, biological, and uh, microbiologic process are uh, in favorable condition. And uh, uh, reduce the toxicity, the mobility, of the concentration in soils. And as I mentioned, after, before is a different way that do it. By biodegradation is one of them. So we were talking about PCE, and biodegradation uh, can happen, but for that we need to know the determination of the, the contamination, and we need to evaluate the site geologically and hydrogeologically. That data is not in the RAP. So other, other factors that should, uh, have to be evaluated is the, uh, uh, the mechanism that occurs in the biodegradation and the effective correlation. And that also is not present in this information. And uh, also have to be the chemical and geological, and that data is not there. So, None of this data is present in, in the proposal to say that MNA will work. So for PC, as mentioned before, PC to degradate have to be some bug, some bacteria. So in this example, PC degraded to, to DC, 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 and I think that is okay to have how to have any of these bacteria, DHC, DHB, DH, I will not go to details. It's one, a lot of uh, research has been done in this, which is the bacteria or, or the microorganisms that have to be present. The fact is, we don't know, because it's no study that is, was done to see if we have that condition to happen. So the conclusion is that the proposal from Geologica to implement MNA in the program for on-site and off-site from groundwater does not have enough data, chemical, geochem geochemical, geological, and hydrogeological, to prove that favorable condition and uh, of NA uh, it will be optimal, and also doesn't say in how long it will happen. So I think that, uh, to summarize, that this proposal uh, to be accepted have to be emphasized how and when 
I'm not little about the MNA. So I am requesting for the board to take in consideration this concern before a separate proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. That was the residents over in Casa Marinewood. Stephen, I'll go on next. All he has to do is find it, right? <clears throat> One thing is to take a look at real quick is to state the mission of the Water Quality Control Board. Preserve, enhance, and restore quality of California's water resources and drinking water for the protection of the environment, public health, and all beneficial uses, and to ensure pure water resource allegation and efficient use for the benefit of present and future generations. The requirements in the order for the site include similar language to that found in the mission statement. Based on our review, that's the Oversight Committee, of the RAP, it does not meet the mission stated or the order. The Board is obligated to act in accordance with their mission statement and the order. Next slide. Up here we have the remedial timeline, which has been talked a lot. I know we're running short on time. The biggest thing is getting a start date, and the biggest item on the timeline is the demolition of the plaza. Without that, not a lot's going to happen to get the job cleaned up. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, we've been through this slide a little bit. Uh, right here at this point, uh, testing has shown that this is roughly eight times drinking water level. This is out on St. Vincent property right here. Uh, testing has not been defined to define what the plume is whether it goes horizontally or laterally, and the depth, so we don't know. It's still an undefined plume, how far it's going to go out, we don't know. Whether it crosses over on this side, we know at this point it did. We don't know anything else about that plume. Three monitoring wells which were proposed in the unit or in the raft does not meet the requirements. Next slide. Okay, uh, in going through it, it needs to be, these are requirements put out, conduct a remedial investigation delineating the lateral and vertical extent of the contaminants in the groundwater. Remedial action plan states that the contaminants plume east of the freeway has not been delineated. U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, known as CERCLA, Guidance mandates that the RAP be based on the results of the RI, which it is. The RI has not been completed. Therefore, the RAP is invalid. Regional Quality Control Board must reject the RAP. Next slide. Feasibility study. This also doesn't comply with the CERCLA and is specifically required by the uh, board's orders. Does not list. Uh, does, not, does not list of evaluated active groundwater. Remediation options for off-site groundwater east of the site. Alternate successful remedial technologies used in Silicon Valley, for example. I know Dave Trotter taught California are not included in the ramp. Active groundwater remediation east of the site is a necessity to ensure cleanup and restore beneficial uses of this high quality water. Millions of gallons of water meeting drinking water standards have been contaminated by the discharge of the volatile organic compound at the site. In summary, the committee requests that the board reject the RAP, incomplete remedial investigation. The FS's incomplete deviates from US EPA guidance and order requirements. Proposed monitor natural attenuation is not applicable since it does not meet the requirements. The RI not completed for plume and monitoring. 
Vertical and lateral extent of the groundwater is unknown. No plans to clean up the plume. We have over here on our right, and Ray Day is going to present another part talking soil vapor, a petition going to the board to reject the plan that you may sign. Ray? Right? Thank you. Got 30 seconds. I'll try and race through this so we can get the slides up. My area deals with the uh, soil vapors, and that's with the off gases that come from the, uh, the contaminants. Okay, the same slide again. Uh, just to review, the slide here shows you where the plume is and this plume extending over into St. Vincent's and also Silvera. And pay, pay particular attention here to the, the extent, not only the extent of the, the, the plume, but also that it doesn't meet the residential cleanup goals in the order. So just keep that in mind when I'm talking about the rest of this. Okay, so here's, here's what we got is the cleanup, the area that um, they're gonna be cleaning up. Oh good, it just died. <laughs> is right here. Okay, the uh, cleaners, I hope everyone can see. The cleaners extended out this way. This is where the hot spot is. And all of this area here is affected by the soil vapors. These little um, areas here are uh, cutoff barriers that they talked about installing. Now, one thing I learned about cutoff barriers is, okay, you can stop the vapors from going in one direction, but after the excavation is done, depending on how that is done, the soil vapors will want to go back towards where the excavation is, okay? Now, the ba barriers are in place, they block, the vapors from going back to the excavation site. Okay, so it's a two-edged sword with having the barriers. Also, another point to mention is that remember we have um, we have sites along and through here where they've detected uh, soil gases, and also on this side of Marinwood Avenue. And some of these are higher than on this side of Marinwood Avenue, okay? At like 2300 versus 570 on the other side. So that is a big issue. Gray, do you think there's been enough testing in Marinwood, uh, in Casa? Uh, my issue with, the, with this as far as the testing is that I think that might be on the next slide. Stephen, maybe you can try that. Uh, go to the next one. No, next one. No, there it is. Okay. With that one, I think uh, Dan was talking about this, where they've got all of these testing sites all along Casa Marinwood, around where all of the, the buildings are. Okay, if you Look where the 2300 right in here and right below it, the 870 monitoring found these, these deposits of soil vapor. They follow right along here. There was no testing along these lines and then the line going right in here to Casa Marinwood. So that's my concern is that how did this, how did the, the vapors get from here to here, and then if it's 2300, 
at one point, why did it all of a sudden stop? Okay? Yes? Okay, so given the geographical distance that the Davis have expanded into the Severa Ranch, now looking over in the west side expansion, once it passes, from what I'm seeing here, <coughs> Marinewood Avenue, you've got those few high numbers, then they go in a few feet into Passamarin Marinewood, not protected, and then no further testing. Well, depending <coughs> on what the geology is down 20 feet below, this could be spreading out as far as Motor Creek School. Plus, out to in either direction, have there been any tests further out? Great question, but it's important to keep in mind we're talking about two different things. Yep. Though. Uh, one is groundwater, one is soil vapor. Yep. So it's not it's not apples and apples necessarily. Okay. Okay. So the so the water the water will go ahead and carry right. the pollution out, out to the Ranch. Out to Silvera Ranch, <coughs> the groundwater. But the soil vapors will want to travel along the utility lines. That's their path, their normal path. The experience has been in other cases. So this is why that is a concern. OK, um, then go back. <laughs> Stephen, I'm sorry. OK, and then after this one. There you go. OK. Uh, a lot has been talked about about uh, uh, MNA, monitored natural attenuation. Uh, it relies on a process to to site it, it's, uh, to achieve site specific cleanup levels. Now, the site specific cleanup levels are expressed in the order it is given to the discharger to Marinewood LLC, okay? So it isn't as if, you know, we came up with these numbers and everything. It's in the order from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Oh. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the ex what we're seeing is that you know, with this cutoff barriers along the utility lines and everything, uh, MNA is a passive approach to meet remediation, and it's it doesn't it can't work over a short period of time. The dry cleaners that have been in operation have been there since 1965 to 2005, 40 years. The site was abandoned for 10 years, and let me ask you the question: Has MNA worked? So that's the question, even if you went to the last date that these cleaners operated. Next slide. Okay, next slide. <laughs> okay, and this is the, the, the challenge with the PCEs. It goes down, it can get, go all the way down through the groundwater and go into the other soil. And this is uh, another concern that you have to get through that groundwater. And we've noted that uh, it's been found below the groundwater at the source. OK, Stephen. Lastly, uh, summary, MNA alone will not work for soil vapors after source excavation. The site was first used by dry cleaners 50 years ago, and high concentration of VOCs are still present. MNA has not worked up to this point. Site cleanup levels for soil vapors are targeted for commercial industrial use while the site is being marketed as a redevelopment area clearly for housing so the levels for cleanup should be set for housing not for commercial use. Uh, remediation needs to be completed at all areas exceeding residential cleanup levels to make it safe for people, including pregnant women and children. And the RAP does not meet remedial investigation and feasibility requirements of the order, item 6D, and EPA guidance from CERCLA. Uh, inadequate uh, extent of the excavation down 
10, 12 feet is just enough of the source area, and geologic, geologic probes have found contamination at around 40, 45 feet, something like that. Uh, several points in the wrap refer to some the different uh, remediation measures not being done until redevelopment occurs. Now I've been heard in the news article that they said we never said that, but there are seven instances where they say within the wrap it depends on redevelopment. So is it what I tell you or what I've written down? And if it doesn't mean it depends on redevelopment, then change the wrap to reflect that. The potential risk, uh, health risk for soil vapors to residents of Castle Marin, Marin was understated due to the inadequate investigation and incomplete risk evaluation. And deed restrictions need to be placed on the site to notify residents, new owners, and commercial users of the pollu pollution and remediation measures that are needed to accomp be accomplished if full remediation is not completed before you know, they, they, in the reasonable amount of time. The timeline for remediation has been expressed by many people, does not have the start date, and it should be when the board approves the wrap. And yes, everyone would like to say approve the wrap anyway because at least they'll start doing something. The only problem is if you do that, it might release them then from cleaning up any further. And that's another concern that I have. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you. I'm going to turn it back to Damon. Uh, anybody has any support for us or anything on the petition? Please come on over here and sign. Let's give another round of applause for our community members. Thank you. So I thought what we could do to wrap up, we, we heard some common themes, some are more technical, what's the right depth to excavate, what does m and A mean? I think there's some more general concepts, so what is the right mix of things we should be, we meaning regulators and uh, those doing the work, should be doing to correct this problem, and what's the timeline? So I'm going to invite Diane White up uh, from the Regional Water Board, but do we have any kind of final, just uh, again, comment cards? Uh, please utilize our sign-up sheets. We've got handouts over here. Written comments, welcome, I think we heard. Um, uh, but any other kind of final issues, I'm going to have Diane kind of wrap it up with those specific and general issues and some of her own thoughts. Go ahead. Just one thing that I'm not clear on in terms of process, because I understand clearly there, there's a time consideration here. If the wrap is rejected as being inappropriate, what is then the timeline and how long is it going to be before another proposal that might be acceptable to the water board, acceptable to all the stakeholders, is produced and then work actually starts on the project. Okay, so Diane's going to answer that. Other questions? Stephen. Actually, this is a comment. I read the wrap and I don't recall seeing one date on the wrap, so I'm going to start my diet tomorrow. I mean, what does that mean? You know, we, we uh, from the get-go, the, the, the polluter has wanted to push this off, push this off, push this off. I'm concerned that this whole wrap is just a, another negotiation strategy to delay cleanup. Further questions? Diane. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the thorough analysis that you put forward here. And, um, we also, just to clarify, the, the wrap was submitted to us and we are in the process of evaluating and digesting it. It's not what we're recommending, it's what we're evaluating right now. So I want to challenge you all, as you're thinking about your comments and what you're going to be submitting to us, to think about what Renee said, because she said something I think very insightful, and that's, you know, is there a possibility of a multi-pronged approach out here so that we could move forward and really get some action done as soon as it feasibly can done, a no regret action 
that we all can agree on that needs to take place and that will have benefit. That's, I, I want to know that first of all from, from all of you because I myself have also been anxious to see something take place out there. And so in looking at this, we're going to be looking for that. We're going to be looking for your comments on that. You know, does anyone oppose demolition of the building and excavation? Does anyone then, when we're talking about excavation, have questions and comments about the size of the excavation? Okay, Th that's very useful information for us because we can think about how we should move forward efficiently with approval processes to get some things done. We're talking also about blocking off some of the trenches in order to avoid any additional migration of vapors that may take place from those utility trenches into the residential area. Are there issues with that, or do we need more data before we do that? That's the questions we have to think about. What do we need more data for in our decision making to drive action, and what kind of action can we do sooner than later? And um, help us with that. Let us know if there's things in there that you do think really could and should happen now, and that we will push for that to get that done and get that locked down in an order so we all have assurances that it's going to take place. And then when those data needs are identified, then we'll identify those, we'll put a time frame on those, and we'll be clear on what we're intending to learn from that additional data that will drive some additional action. So that's how I'm thinking about this problem. I appreciate everyone diving deep into it. Help us with this next step. Help us get there efficiently. Let us know if we can help you Get, understand that better. Today was our, our first attempt at doing that. The phone lines are open. We'll come meet with you. A group of you can come down and meet with us. We're going through the, the reports ourselves. We have technical consultants who have been preparing this. We will challenge them back for additional information <coughs> if that's what's needed to get there. So I think we all have the same end goal in mind. It's just really figuring out how to make it happen. And it's taken a while to get to where we are now. But it's exciting to me to be in the place we're at now because we're getting very close to having action. So that's what I think we're all about. And you know, we're really open to hearing how we can make that happen. But I think we're running out of time and running out of steam tonight. But you know, please, please follow up. We'll stay a few minutes longer as well. So if you want to make sure you have our contact information, got that, and then we're open to suggestions about next steps. And Diane, uh, to the gentleman's question, theoretically, if this plan was rejected, how would that affect the time? If this plan is rejected, then we have to ask them, we have to give them comments about what else we need them to do to propose something else that we believe would be acceptable, and they'll have to tell us how much time that may take, and we'll have to make a decision on that. Now, that's not saying, again, we can reject part of it. We can phase it out. We can do, I believe we can do what makes sense. I just want to have us all figure out what, what that, that is. And we have the legal means to, to do that. So um, we just have to figure that part out. So the plan is not as proposed, it is not a take it or leave it. You can say, yes, proceed with this, we're rejecting this as inadequate, you're going to have right. to come back to right. us with more. Right. The only thing we really try not to do is have someone do something and then make them take it out well, yeah. and do it again differently. So those are, you know, so that we want enough information to know that what we're doing is a no regret action that's going to have benefit. There was some mention of, of a mechanism that sounded like to prompt faster response in the event of rejection of the RAP. So if the RAP, there was some mention of a $5,000 monetary penalty that accumulates. That sounds almost as though rejecting the RAP may force the property owner to move more quickly. Is that fair to say, or how does that those, work? Those, those penalties are discretionary. They're not automatic. They need to be based on a whole bunch of other factors that's in this in an enforcement policy, if that's not a quick and easy solution. It provides motivation because what we told you is the maximum liability that could be imposed, but actually imposing penalties is a long process. And I think we do have a, a party who is 
taking our input, and I want to believe until we get to a place that you know we get re pushed back, that they have expressed a willingness to do what we think needs to be done. So you know, we'll, we'll use that tool when, it, when we need it, but we'll take the first step of figuring out exactly what we need to do first. Any final questions? Okay, well thank you, Diane. Thank you to all the other participants. Thank you, Stephen, um, and mostly thanks to all of you for coming out on, on your weeknight and, and sharing your thoughts with us. So, we'll be in touch.